Welcome back there, students. Time to extend our learning with uh, uh, more videos. Today, the video is about bonding. That's right. James bonding. Come on, that's got to be worth something. So basically, uh, bonds in a nutshell. Anytime you have a bond, and make sure you're filling in your notes while we go here. Uh, anytime you have two or more atoms together, that is, that's going to be a bond. So anytime you're connecting two more atoms together, that would be a bond. Uh, effectively, a bond is an interaction between the outermost electrons of the cloud. There's your next two blanks, interaction and that electron. Bonds are represented by drawing a stick or a line. For example, if I was going to bond a carbon to another carbon, I would draw a little line between them. That line represents a bond between two carbon atoms. You do not need to include all the numbers that go along with the symbol when we're showing the bonds because, uh, well, the bond doing will be enough work as it is. Notice I said valence electrons, and that's our next blank. The valence electrons are the electrons found in the outermost shell or outermost orbital. So the outer orbital or outer shell of an atom, that's where we find the valence electrons. These electrons are important because it's going to determine how an element will interact with other elements. Depending on how many valence electrons and where those val valence electrons are, how far out from the nucleus they are, is going to sort of affect how elements will interact. So we need to really understand uh, these valence electrons so we can understand bonding, so we can understand their interactions, so we can understand chemistry and, and, and chemical reactions. It's also going to determine what kind of charge there's going to be. So we can determine how an element will ionize, what charges it will have based on it, its valence electrons as well. So for those of you wondering, like, why do we even care about the valence electrons? Well, this is why we can tell a lot of things from our valence electrons. Before we get too crazy here, remember the valence electrons are in the outermost shell. So on this Bohr model, which you'll notice is not lithium, not at all, but on this Bohr model right here, we have one, two valence electrons. We have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve electrons total, but we only have one, two valence electrons. Now, in the box in your notes right there, you're going to draw the Bohr model for lithium. Now, you've already done this, just a plain old regular lithium, not a weird isotope, not a weird ion. Just draw a Bohr model of lithium and label those valence electrons. When you're done with that, you need to raise your hand and show real life Patterson while he's stuck in the class. Do that, then raise your hand, show real life Patterson. If he approves it, then you're ready to move on to the next part. All right, so the purpose of the valence electrons, the reason why the outer shells need to be full, that's what we're talking about right now. So the outer shell, right, the outermost shell, or sometimes you could call it the valence shell, needs to be full of electrons for the atom to be stable. So a stable atom has a full outer shell. When we looked at some of those ions, the Bohr models that you guys were making, remember I pointed out every time you had an ion before, they had a full outer shell. So full outer shell, very important. Outer shell will be full if it has eight electrons in it. This is actually called the octet rule. So it says the octet rule states that the outer shell or outer orbital of an atom will be full if it has eight electrons. Now, usually it's eight because most of the elements that we look at, uh, we're going to be looking at ones that have two, maybe three shells. And those both, right? The first one takes two, second one takes eight, third one takes also eight. That being said, if you have a very small atom, so smaller atoms like hydrogen and helium only require two because they have a tiny shell. And if it's a super large one, if we're getting out to the fourth shell, then we may require 18. Some of them require even more. Ooh, frightening and scary, even more. The next few blanks won't appear on the screen, but you'll be ready for them. On the periodic table, yeah, we're talking about it again. On the periodic table, the family, that's the column. Remember, columns 
go up and down this away, up and down. The family number tells you how many valence electrons the element will have. If you're not sure how to spell any of those words, they're up here in the notes. Periodic table shows you how many valence electrons will be in each family. However, you have to know that these weirdos in the middle, they're weirdos, they don't count. They're weirdos. They're called the transition elements, and they do weird stuff, and pretty much you have to memorize them on an element-by-element -element basis or draw out the Bohr model to figure out how many valence electrons there are, like we did with lithium, right? You start in the middle, you had two, then when you moved out, you just had that one little valence electron over there. Speaking of lithium, look at what family it's in. Here's my friend and yours, lithium. You'll notice it is in the first family, and that is because the very first family, all of these elements have one valence electron. Hydrogen, one valence electron. Lithium, one valence electron. Sodium, one valence electron. Potassium, one valence electron. You guys see how this works? If it's in family one, it has one, va one valence electron. In your notes there, you says at the bottom, fill the table above with the number of valence electrons found in each family, so make sure you do that. These will have one valence electron. The second family will have two valence electrons because it's the second family. Oh, look at how easy it is. Beryllium's got two valence electrons. Magnesium has two valence electrons. Calcium, you made Bohr models for these and you saw they each had two valence electrons. Keep in mind, once we get down here, we need eight in the outer shell to feel full. Then we skip all the weirdos. And even though this says 13, that's family number three. Family number three right here, they all have three valence electrons. Family number four, they all have four valence electrons. I'll bet you can see where we're going with this. This one, column number 15, that's family number five. And they have five valence electrons. Family number six right here, these all have six valence electrons. That's right, oxygen has six valence electrons. Here is family number seven, and family number seven, everyone in family number seven has seven valence electrons. Just one away from eight, which makes them super heavily reactive. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, but for now we're just learning about valence electrons. The electrons that determine how an element will interact with other elements. These ones over here make them very reactive. These ones over here having just one or two also makes them very reactive because it's very easy to get rid of that one or two. Everything over here in family eight has eight valence electrons. Eight is what we need for a full shell. So all of these elements over here in the family we call the noble gases, they don't react at all because they already have a full shell. They don't need to gain or give up valence electrons to fill that outer shell. We'll be talking more about that once we really get more into bonding, but for now, I need you to go to the next assignment where you will be drawing what we call Lewis dot structures. A Lewis dot structure is similar to a Bohr model, only we don't care what's in the nucleus and we only care about the valence electrons. So you're going to show me the Lewis dot structure, use your periodic table, use the family position to help you determine which elements have what number of valence electrons. Good. Thanks for watching. Flip it over. Flop it over. Stop this recording too.